Good afternoon, and if you're uh, arriving on campus for the first time, welcome. If you're not here uh, for the first time this weekend, I hope you've been welcomed already, but know that all of you are very welcome. It's, it's so great to see so many uh, folks, friends, alumni coming back this weekend. Um, many of you were here at the session that just happened where Don Crable uh, talked about his book and I gave a more extensive introduction there. So I'm going to uh, uh, spare you hearing that again and uh, turn things over very quickly so that uh, we can all get to this event that I know many of us have been looking forward to, um, to hear our four uh, living presidents uh, reflect on their experience <laughs> at EMU. <laughs> we, we thought about trying to conjure up some of, those, some of those who've passed on, but we thought that might not be a good idea. Um, our MC for the afternoon and, and leading the conversation is going, is going to be Don Crable. Uh, many of you know him. For those of you don't, who don't, he's the author of our centennial history, has a very distinguished uh, biography, and I encourage you to buy the book and read the, read the blurb on the jacket cover to learn more about who Don is if you don't, if you don't know him. But Don, welcome. Thanks for leading us in this conversation. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, one of the events I've really looked forward to uh, on the weekend, and uh, uh, we'll need about a half an hour here or so uh, to uh, have a conversation with each of the presidents, and then we'll have time for Q&A, um, and so it should be very interesting. We are very fortunate, very fortunate as an institution to have four living presidents. <laughs> Uh, it's rather remarkable in many ways, and uh, we're going to go by their tenure, starting with Myron, and uh, I have three uh, questions for each of them. One, the first question is uh, for them to reflect on a defining moment, a significant moment in their presidency, and then secondly, uh, uh, something of satisfaction, one of their achievements that they take satisfaction in. Uh, and then finally, a prank or a story that they would like to tell us uh, that happened during their time. We're going to start with Myron Augsburger, who uh, was president from 1965 to 1980. And Myron and I were just reflecting last evening. What is remarkable, and very remarkable, is he came here in 1947 as a first-year student in the college, which means he has 70 years 70 years, seven decades, almost three quarters of our centennial history. <clears throat> and it gets even better because in Ohio, his neighbor was J.B. Smith, the first president, and Myron would go over as a teenager and talk theology with J.B. Smith. So he goes back the whole way. <laughs> So that's wonderful, and Myron, we're delighted to have you here. And I want to just say a personal word. I don't know, were you in, in the immediate session here? Somebody, I, I, it's my testimony that I learned the word Anabaptist first from Myron. I came in 1965, I was here for two years, my last two years of college, 65, 67. Myron was in his first two years of the presidency. And uh, we had the good fortune of hearing him preach. He was a tremendous preacher in chapel. Uh, however, we did have fun uh, estimating in advance how many times he would use the word perspective each time when he was <laughs> preaching. Uh, but he was a great preacher, and I learned about Anabaptist history in a seminar with him. And so it's really delight, uh, a delight for me to uh, be, have this part in the program and introduce Myron. So Myron, um, a defining moment in your presidency, one that stands out. It's very difficult to select. Yeah, does this, this thing work? Excuse me. A defining moment. I think uh, one of the things that strikes me is when we finished the science building and we had gotten a government grant, and then I heard that we had one more opportunity for a government grant and then they would be canceled, and we wanted to build a library. But we weren't quite ready for that in terms of our fundraising. So I went to Charlottesville and met the committee, made the application, and came back to announce that we had a grant for a new library. And then the students picked this up and uh, took on what we called a library drive. And the amazing thing was they went out and gathered things from all over this neighborhood. We had an auction sale in the gym over here. 
and we had that thermometer up there, and John Lapp was running it, and as the bids would go up, well, this got pushed up and pushed up, and finally, by a oh, quarter till two, two o'clock in the morning, I auctioned off the last thing to take us over the top, and it was Truman Brunk's necktie. I reached out and pulled it <laughs> off. <of her>. So, <laughs> that's a, a defining moment, but I want to tell you, this is a good perspective, good perspective here. <laughs> <laughs> And I think it was 111,000. Yes, it they, was. They overshot the goal by 11,000, and the students did this in four days. They did That's that. That's what was amazing. Four days. That was a once in a lifetime. We haven't seen anything to match no. it. Uh, and he commented about my long history here. I came to EMC from Ohio to call on a young lady who was here in high school. <laughs> and now we've had 67 years, the end of November. <laughs> Esther, where is she? Yeah. So, Myron, a, uh, a, a time or an event uh, of, that you would take satisfaction in, an achievement, what, you know, something that you look back on the presidency and have a, have a strong sense of happiness, satisfaction about it. One thing that was, I think, very unique, and the people from other universities came to study what we were doing, was the development of what we call the interdisciplinary curriculum. That was something that nobody else had done this way. And what it was was simply to say that we are not a educational program with a little religion tacked on the edge, like many colleges related to the church, but they're like any other secular educational program except a required chapel or something like this. And we developed a program in which you integrate the Christian faith with the whole liberal arts. And we set up seven key courses each one taught by five different professors from five different disciplines. And they modeled what it meant to integrate your faith and your discipline, and then to integrate the interpretations as they overlap. That's a shorty, but that's really what I think was uh, very unique. And it was here for a good while, and when the adjustments have followed to more international dimensions and so on, it hasn't been with the intent of losing that integration of faith and culture, the arts, and so on. And um, in the book, and I don't know if I got this right or not, actually I think I, when I interviewed you, you mentioned this. Um, this is a ma was a massive transformation in the curriculum. And if, you, if any of you have been faculty members or know anything about a faculty, it is very, very hard to do a massive transformation of the curriculum because oh, wow. everybody has their favorite course. And you t said at one point the committee was giving up on it. They, they said, it, Myron, it won't work. And uh, you, were, right. you were scheduled to go away to Berlin. I was going to and Berlin. And you canceled the flight to stay to make it happen. And it happened. That's right. <laughs> we met the evening before for several hours, came out of there convinced that we could go ahead with it. So I went to Berlin late. I was there to participate in the Billy Graham Congress on Evangelism. And uh, I went with the satisfaction that we didn't cancel it. Now, a, a prank or a story? Ah, uh, I guess I can, <laughs> I'll tell this one. My predecessor, Dr. John Mumo, is a man I respected very highly. He was president here for 17 years. And uh, in the spring of 65, he married Evelyn King, our dean of women, and they took off and made a round the world tour. And so I was called by the board to become acting president from that April date until the end of June, because my term began July 1st, 1965. And uh, the interesting thing is, uh, about a year later, when Brother Mumma and Evelyn were back, I had him speak in chapel. And this is my little note. I introduced him to the student body because they didn't really know this man a lot of the new students. And when he stepped up to the pulpit to speak, the evening before we had had a drama, and they took the motto, Thy Word is Truth, they took it down because of the drama, drama and so on. And Brother Mumo's first comments when he stepped up to the platform was, I see that since I'm no longer president, the college has removed the motto, Thy Word is Truth. <laughs> <laughs> that was my most embarrassing moment. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Joe uh, Lapp served as president from 1987 to 2003, and that was a time when I was on the board of trustees for part of that, so we had the pleasure of serving together. And before that, Joe, you had been on the board, I think, for about 12 years, maybe the youngest member ever selected to the board of trustees, yes. and it had was, chaired uh, it. It was 13 years. 13 years. 1973. So, Joe, a defining moment. Um, of your presidency? Well, the, the, the question as I received it, Don, was what were the challenges? It keeps so changing. It keeps changing. You, you answer, so whether you answer uh, whatever question you want to. <laughs> <laughs> was, it was soon after I was, I was appointed. Uh, one of my attorney friends, uh, uh, I guess I mentioned the name, J. Elvin Craybill. Uh, said, why would you leave a good practice and join a sinking ship? <laughs> well, that was, uh, that was the way, that was the, the character of the situation, circumstances at, at EMU in 1986, 87. Uh, and so it was, a, it was a difficult time. It was an issue of enrollment. It was an issue of revenue. And it was an issue of of uh, campus morale, and so those three things were things we needed to needed to immediately work at. And uh, so enrollment, we had the benefit of a nice jump in 1987, which wasn't the, wasn't my doing, and uh, but it was the work that had been done by the community before uh, during the year or so before. Uh, Revenue was something that we had, and that helped us revenue-wise because we had to jump in enrollment. Mm -hmm. And so little things like that along the way, we were able to work at with uh, adding, uh, constantly working at enrollment, working at new revenue sources, uh, such as ADCP, uh, the Adult Degree Completion Program, IEP, Intensive English Program, uh, we developed a, an office for summer programs and conferences, which added revenue, and then the graduate programs came along as well. So they become uh, sources of revenue. And the morale, was, uh, the morale improved, I think, in my perception, as time went on and as these things developed. I felt like I needed to be an encourager of new ideas and that it wasn't my ideas, even though once in a while I had a crazy idea, but, there was, but it was allowing other people, other people's ideas to be developed and encourage them to proceed. So uh, if there was one uh, point of program or uh, development that you take satisfaction in looking back, what, what would that program or thing be? They all, they were all. I mean, we, we now look at historically and say CJP was very right. significant. Uh, there would be other people who would have participated in the, in the development of CPE, the Clinical Pastoral Education Program at the seminary, or some in the counseling program. So all of these programs together allowed us to become university, and I think the event of doing that historically has proven to be the right thing. And um, can I make a confession? That when I was on the board and you said, well, you were thinking we should, I, I laughed out loud. <laughs> you, weren't, you weren't the only one. <laughs> Is Jim Rosenberger here today? Yeah, someplace I thought I saw him. <laughs> but uh, that was a big change. Yeah. And, and, and it really worked, uh, but it was uh, a surprise. And uh, it took me a little while to warm up to it, but I came around. <laughs> and I, I received a collection of wonderful things to celebrate emus. <laughs> I, had a, I had a pack of cigarettes, uh, emu cigarettes from Central America. <laughs> I had a bottle of emu wine from Australia or New Zealand. <laughs> and some emu um, 
<laughs> emu jerky. Uh, <laughs> 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 and and it, it developed into quite a, a, a collection of things that was always fun. Right. Uh, a prank or a story? Well, there's several that I could tell, but in 1993, Hannah and I went to, took a group of students to the Middle East and leading that group in the fall of 93. And during the fall, I, I didn't get my hair cut. I just let my hair grow. And uh, when I came back, it was pretty long, and, and I, so I just left it, continued to, to grow. I probably had it trimmed a little bit someplace along the way, but uh, this, this really aggravated some people, and uh, particularly my friend Sam Weaver, he'd come back and tell me that people were saying it was not very presidential, um, <laughs> and, uh, and I, was, I was able to pull it back into a little ponytail about this long, <laughs> and, but, but this was, in my mind, it was more fun aggravating people in... in <laughs> Uh, somehow we have to let some rebellion out here. <laughs> and then it turned out that uh, the, in the fall of 94, I think, the YPCA wanted to have a fundraiser. And so the fundraiser was if they raised so much money, I would cut my hair, I guess it was. Something, <laughs> something like that. Okay, uh, Lauren. Um, Lauren was uh, president from... 2003 to 2016, and um, you came from Iowa as a child. Originally, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I th you were the uh, you were the first president from the far west, from in here. <laughs> Ohio is still in the east, you know, and, and Pennsylvania. So, so uh, Lauren, a defining moment, a you know, a challenge uh, that you'd like to reflect on. Well, I would say it's not necessarily a moment, but the issues of sexuality ha are, in, in my mind, are absolutely uh, the number one challenge that I dealt with from the beginning, starting with a demonstration on campus one week after my inauguration. Um, and Twyla Yoder called me. I was on the way to another inauguration. You can read this whole story in Don's book. And she said, there's a rainbow demonstration on the front lawn. And I said, well, I'm not coming back. Send Ken uh, Nafsinger uh, <laughs> to talk to them. But that, that evolved, and that became a 13-year-long conversation, as it has been in the church. So I would say that's the number one challenge that I faced for all of my 13 years. And uh, something that gives you satisfaction as you look back, a program or a development or something that... Uh is a source of satisfaction. Well, one highlight, uh, which had nothing to do with me, uh, and as Joe implied, and Myron too, this, these are team efforts. But, but one highlight was getting the word on Lima Bowie's uh, re having received the Nobel Peace Prize. And um, EMU, because there were three awardees that year, EMU got only one ticket. And I've said many times, I made almost no decisions by myself, but that one I made. <laughs> I'm going uh, with one week advance notice. So that's a highlight to think about, uh, reflect back on. I would say also uh, the solar project because it was symbolic of sustainability being a defining um, part of EMU's history going way back into the 60s already. And that solar project on the library was the largest this one This is in on Virginia. the roof, roof of the library. Roof of the Hartzler Library. That, at the time, was the largest commercial solar installation in the state of Virginia. Uh, it's now been surpassed by, by many others. So I would, and then I would just say, again, this is in relationship to your book, because you talked about the relationships with Goshen. Because of my history of having worked for the Mennonite Board of Education for 10 years and having been hired by that group specifically because I was an EMU graduate, the relationships, I think, have been uh, put at a different level than what they would have been going back before your day. I mean, way well, back. I mean, it, that feels like a foreign territory now because of the relationships of the presidents and our uh, capacity to work together 
Uh, Shirley Showalter certainly had a lot to do with that when she was at Goshen. Uh, Jim Brenneman, uh, of course, then I was at Heston for 10 years. So that all changed that right. relationship pretty dramatically. And then, of course, Bethel and Bluffton coming into the orbit made yet another level of change right. that I think is for the good. A prank or a story? Well, uh, two. So here's a piece well, wait, of... Wait, wait, wait. No, well, no. well, this is short. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> so this is April Featherbrain, 2004, one week, one month after my inauguration, uh, a, a picture that's photoshopped of me at the residence uh, with a police car in the driveway. <laughs> uh, they got a, a real picture of my face by misleading me as to why they were taking the photo, but then they put my face on this picture, and it was a drunken brawl. And uh, <laughs> the title is Cops Bust Party at Presidential Residence. Um, but the funniest thing, I just went back to this. So MJ Sharp was the news editor. Uh, <laughs> but the funniest thing is way down at the bottom, it says, in a little sidebar, it says that I'm going to, I've decided to run for president of the United States. Uh, but if, if, if that, I think that'll go well, I'm supposedly saying. And then it says, if I'm successful, maybe I'll aim to become the Russian Kremlin in a few years. <laughs> <laughs> this was 14 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the bison incident. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the, as I reflect back on that, 5 o'clock in the morning, you know, they try to hoist the stuffed bison from the science center up to the top of Oakwood, and a kid slips, falls off, and he lands on his stomach. Ken Navsinger and I get there. Uh, the news reporter comes and sees this full life-size bison with its head down in the bushes on the north side of Oakwood, <laughs> and the security guy is, like, out of his mind. He doesn't know what to do. <laughs> but the worst part of it was the kid, we didn't have the identity of the kid. He was out, and his friends, who were part of the prank, had called 911, and when the helicopter landed, which, by the way, landed, and nobody in the dorms woke up. <laughs> Unbelievable. But anyway, the helicopter took off, and so these other kids went to UVA to meet him. We didn't know who the kid was that was on the ground. I mean, he can't respond, and here's where social media comes in. They, on the way to Charlottesville, are texting their parents. And so parents are notified before we know who, what we're dealing with. It was, but anyway, it was Bob Johnson's grandson. So those of you who remember Bob Johnson, and then his son, this is a generational prankster family. <laughs> <laughs> and so he recovered, and you had a chapel presentation that morning on sustainability? Yeah. Well, it's so, true. <laughs> so BBC was on campus. They wanted to do a program on two Christian college approaches to global warming. <laughs> and they had been at Liberty the week before. Then they came here. And the story was supposed to air the next week. But on Monday morning was Virginia Tech. So the story really didn't get aired until one month later to the day. And I got an email from one of our grads in the UK saying, I just heard your voice on BBC. And I called marketing and said, you know, it's all very likely that we might get some media attention. I mean, after all, it's Jerry Falwell and me. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I, I, I've rarely told this story in public, but it's in the book, <laughs> that the irony was that within an hour, Jerry Falwell died of a heart attack in his office back in, in uh, Lynchburg, and the story basically never aired. I mean, because it got overtaken by, I mean, That's right. I don't, I mean, there's a, you go along, you can go many directions with that story, but I should but stop. No, but the student, <laughs> the student did recover. The student recovered. I visited him on Monday. And when I figured out who he was, <clears throat> by that time his dad was in the hospital room at UVA, and I said, look, I've heard stories about Bob, your grandfather. I know your dad. Now I know you, and I'm telling you, 
before you ever have kids at EMU, I'm out of here. <laughs> so, <laughs> Susan, uh, you can be prepared for the next generation. <laughs> um, Susan, uh, you've only had uh, a semester here to kind of uh, wrap up the centennial, and uh, you don't quite have as much long historical perspective. So you may want to ask them some questions or share some other comments. That's right. When uh, Don shared, these are the questions that I want all four of you to answer, I thought, well, that's a little presumptuous. I've only been here nine months and counting. A defining moment? Uh, for, I'm still in the honeymoon period, so there hasn't even been any knock on wood pranks. So uh, yes, I would, I think, prefer to uh, ask some questions. And let me just say, and this is not just a blatant plug for Don's book, one of the real sources of inspiration for me was having the opportunity to read this in advance uh, for all kinds of reasons. Because while I am steeped in Mennonite higher education, I am not in terms of this area. My mother has connections to this area. So I learned a lot. I, the, the value proposition of EMU really shot up for me. And I, it was a little bit like a cheat sheet because I, I actually knew what these guys were going to say today <laughs> because it's in the book. And so maybe I can avoid some mistakes and, and maybe I can aspire uh, to some of the of the greatness here. So it is a great book. It's entertaining and scholarly, and you don't often get those two things in the same book. Uh, so again, thank, thank you. you very much, Don. It's thank a good uh, uh, lesson and primer uh, for me, uh, EMU Second Century. So I wanted to ask some questions. Uh, they're a little different, uh, obviously, than the ones Don asked you to uh, prepare. And just a brief, brief is good, less is more. I'm from the journalistic tradition. Uh, so the first is a question about your greatest joy. You know, when my mother learned that I got this gig at EMU, she said to me, congratulations, Susan, and my condolences. <clears throat> so, you know, I know this job uh, has huge demands, and as president, you must relate to an amazing number of stakeholders. It's a 24-7 job. You're never not the president. But the Chronicle of Higher Education for years has conducted research that shows 89% of all college presidents report having huge job satisfaction, even if they only served short tenures. So my question then is, despite its many demands, what is the greatest joy you have experienced in serving at EMU? Well, I would, I would say almost always has to do with students. Um, I used to say if I could go to a theater event, a music event, an athletic event, an art show every day, I could do this for a long time. It's when you see the students doing their thing. Now obviously most of it happens in the classroom, but that's not what I got to see uh, directly, but it's, it's seeing the student accomplishments and then following them, if you're around long enough, following them as graduates and what they're doing as alumni. The one, <clears throat> the one occasion that I probably was rather exuberant uh, around campus, and I remember uh, getting this check, I think it was a check from the Lilly Foundation for about a it was a million five or a million seven, and I can't tell you now exactly what it was for, but <laughs> it was... <laughs> Presidential but it was, travel. <laughs> it was, it was a, a check that you don't so often receive, but I went around, uh, carried that to the business office and was exclaiming to quite a few people. Uh, and maybe that says something about my avariceness, uh, um, uh, Lauren. I reckon the greatest thing for me was working with the faculty that were my, my peers to share with them and uh, not only to have their support but also their criticisms and counsel, but to just to be a part of a team and not be a lone wolf. This was the most important. I did come and go a lot. I had a lot of speaking engagements and that was a little problem for a lot of faculty members, what I was doing out with these other groups and uh, there were some fear 
that I was moving us away from Mennonite to the interdenominational pattern. So it was very important to me to make clear my relation to the Mennonite church, and that was uh, one of my greater challenges. Mm -hmm. Susan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. this, this is a question about help meets or our better halves. We all know the demands of the presidency, and uh, we all know that we need help. Uh, so my question to all three of you, what are your recommendations for caring for and empowering your spouse? In, in Don's book, all three of your spouses come in for uh, good praise, and I thank you, Don, uh, for that. Uh, Pat, Hannah, and Esther are not just footnotes in this book, and I'm pleased uh, to see that. Uh, so again, my spouse is here. He is the first dude of EMU, <laughs> Jess Huxman, and I'd like some tips from you on how you cared for and empowered your spouse to work alongside as a team. Well, I would say it's really important for the community to recognize the contribution of the spouse and say that often to that spouse directly because uh, they don't hear it necessarily all that often. But they do invest an enormous amount of emotional and physical energy into this job. We had two eras. My era at Heston, Pat was full-time employed, but we had children at home yet. And so that made it a little different. But when we came here, she made a conscious decision to just be a full-time volunteer. Uh, so that changed the relationship. But I had the benefit of a spouse who had been an executive in her own right, and particularly had done a lot of fundraising. So that was a real help to me because she understood that primary part of my role and was very helpful to me in that respect. So uh, each pattern is different. Spouses can, can be full-time employed. Sometimes they're employed by the institution. That can work. I think giving the, the spouse flexibility to do what he or she wants to do is really important. It was early on, I think, in my tenure that, uh, and maybe right from the beginning, I had asked uh, trustees to uh, allow Hannah to have a stipend of some kind to recognize her contribution and her participation in the office of president. And, and I think that was important. Um, when we moved here uh, in June of 1987, it was... Um, about right after that, I, I left for Pittsburgh and uh, went to Carnegie Mellon uh, College uh, Management Program for several weeks. And so she felt like I kind of dumped her and Johanna off here um, for several weeks. Uh, probably wasn't the best idea, but that's the way the logistics worked. But Hannah was crucial in making community con connections for, for us here. She played a very important role in uh, various organizations. Uh, and so that was helpful. And I think having the spouse recognized in an official way as being part of the team is, is, is important in my mind. Well, Esther was a help meet. She could tell you that when I was inaugurated, she came into the auditorium and said, where do I sit? And the usher said, well, anywhere. So she sat down there in the middle of the audience. We had the inauguration. She wasn't acknowledged, ever mentioned. So on the way out, I stopped in the aisle at the end of the bench, and she joined me, and we walked across the campus together to where we had the reception. That was sort of the beginning. Uh, in those days, I didn't control the budget, but I should have had more influence. In the spring of the year at commencement, we followed uh, Brother Mumo's pattern and had a meeting with all the parents and the graduates coming to our house, and we had a treat in the backyard. And she literally prepared up until it got to be 700 people, then she said, I've had it. Well, I, I should have interfered before that. But that's just to tell you uh, what it meant for Esther and me to walk together, and uh, she did a lot of things that I couldn't have done if it wouldn't have been for her sharing. Uh, she could tell you that uh, sometimes she was the intermissionary, uh, intermediator. Never forget the wee hours of the morning when I got a phone call 
from Mr. Shank, who is uh, looking after the grounds at night down there on the campus. And he said uh, there's a, a pony and some sheep down here at the door of the gym. <laughs> and I was half asleep. I said to Esther, where, where in the world is the gym? <laughs> but I, I got up and dressed and came down and got a hold of the pony's uh, bridle. And uh, the sheep followed, and we went back up across the hill. And Lester Shank laughed and laughed about this, about <laughs> leading these sheep back over the hill. That's just a couple. Well, thank you uh, very much. We want to take some time for uh, Q&A uh, from the audience, and I will uh, try to moderate that. So you may want to direct your question to a particular uh, uh, person and um, any comments or questions you'd like to make, and I will try to repeat them or, or, uh, for, for the, uh, the video. Who would like to go first? Where is the first dude? Where is there a oh. Dude Jesse. Here he is. Stand up. <clears throat> Someone else. Okay. The question is, uh, 58 graduate is asking, when um, EMU became a liberal arts institution? Yes. Yes, the first accreditation takes place in 1959 when the Sachs Association, uh, which is the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, accredited uh, Eastern Mennonite. And that's different than the state has to accredit it to give it permission to offer courses and degrees, but this is more like a collegiate accreditation. And I remember right. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the word liberal is uh, tr troublesome and problematic sometimes uh, in terms of the way it's used in the academy versus uh, a political orientation. Um, do you want to comment on the liberal arts thing uh, uh, in terms of when it would have been? My, my memory tells me when I was a student, first 47 and 8, that's when the transition was coming. And within a year, we became known as a liberal arts college. I think maybe, maybe the end of the 40s. It would have been a junior college up until that point, uh, but then in 1947 it becomes uh, a college. Um, part of it, I'm not sure the root of your question, uh, part of it is the distinction between what actually is a liberal arts college, and typically that's identified by a college that requires general education alongside professional programs. So that if you're an accountant or if you're an uh, occupational therapist or uh, in, in some pre-professional or professional uh, program, you also have to take general education with it. And I think, um, I mean, the college was attempting to do that back in the 40s. Uh, people like C.K. Lehman, that's what they were trying to do. And to what extent that would fit our definitions today, I'm not quite sure. I don't know, if is that helpful? Yeah, I, um, the, the, yeah, that, I'm trying to. <laughs> I, I'm trying to, so I, I think the question is, uh, to what extent, uh, I mean, a, a liberal arts college in a broad national sense would not uh, be a religious institution and would allow students to pursue any kind of inquiry or raise questions that they want to. Um, that was always somewhat of a tension at, at, at EMU, um, but I think Dean Ira Miller, for example, in the 50s worked at that question, uh, and yet there were some limits to, uh, way to what kind of research you might do or what kind of study some of the students might do. Well, the question would often come up, well, I shouldn't say often, but occasionally would come up. Are you liberal arts? What does that mean? Um, I, I was going to add a comment on accreditation because I thought about this earlier when it came up in the previous conversation. I remember, and some of my colleagues were with me, when we had a meeting with a church group, church leaders, about 
four years ago. Uh, some of them were not happy with EMU, and uh, one person in particular said, why don't you just give up accreditation? Because, meaning, he understood that accreditation requires something of an institution. I mean, you, you don't have as much freedom when you're accredited as if you're not accredited. But the problem is, in our world, if you're not accredited, you don't exist. Unless you have millions of dollars of endowment, and even then, your students would have a hard time getting into grad school. So it was completely preposterous to think that we would no longer be accredited in order so that we might have certain freedoms that he wanted us to have. Yeah. Joe? I think the question arose mostly when, during my tenure, uh, having to do with internal discussions. Because internally, there were faculty who felt like we were losing the liberal arts or uh, we were uh, eliminating liberal arts courses in favor of professional study programs. And so it, it seemed to be more of an internal discussion than it was uh, external. Uh, uh, so it was the competition within various faculty departments. Mayor? I'm reaching in my memory, but I believe that Brother Mumo was working for accreditation in the late 50s. Right. It, it, and they, it's the whole time the, during the 50s they're working on it. Right. Until One of the big issues was having an endowment, and we didn't have enough finances. He came up with a plan that they went out and got certain kinds of commitments without the actual money, but they built up enough that the Southern Association finally approved what he had done, and then we moved to accreditation. But it, interestingly, that was the issue more than the academic. But two programs that really pushed us toward uh, accreditation were the science program, thanks to Daniel Souter, and a lot in the pre-med and the nursing and the other was the educational program because we graduated a lot of people to be teachers. There are other majors, but those were the two, as I remember, mm -hmm. that really pushed us toward getting accredited. All right, uh, someone else. Yes. I never considered uh, very much uh, that there was much flack. There were uh, kind of snide comments made regarding uh, how do you expect to be uh, be a university, or what makes you think you can be a university, those kinds of comments. But it, it was, um, I, I don't think it was a reaction in, in a negative way that was really discouraging to me. But it was, um, uh, it was just, it, it raised the expectation, is what it seemed to me. So that if you want to be a university, then then you're going to have to act like one, and you're going to have to develop uh, consistent with being a university. So um, I told Don that when we were talking about becoming a university, Don was chair of the board. And, and uh, we had discussed it as a board and had, had the chuckles. And it was uh, a week or two later when he called me and says, you know, this idea has been growing on me. And then I knew that it, was go it, co it could happen. Uh, because if, we, if I had that support and, and knew that uh, others were, were going to come around. All right, uh, someone else? Yes. Uh, the question was uh, uh, first um, a comment that in the early years of EMS, uh, the, the church was pushing for a Bible school and Bible courses, and that's correct. Uh, I mean, the, the, this institution starts as really a first two years of high school and a Bible school. And the Bible school stays throughout uh, uh, the, the decades, through the decades, and morphs into the seminary about 1964-65. So that theme has stayed the whole way through. And um, however, from the very beginning, there was also concern about vocational education. In the, in the very first draft of the Constitution in, in Denby in 1913, uh, there, there, there's concern not only for teaching Bible courses, but for practical skills, for vocational skills uh, as well. Now, that's a little bit different than liberal arts. It, it, 
it, it's more vocational. Um, I, my sense is partly what happens is as new faculty are hired, they are interested in the liberal arts. Uh, you get, uh, you get uh, classifications from national accrediting organizations of her rankings and so on uh, for liberal arts. And so that sort of gradually happens over time. And it may not be so much the church is pushing for it, but over time, the institution develops its own identity uh, to making, making changes. Well, I think it's a Bible, it's a college now. It's Rosedale College, I believe. And I, pardon? I can't answer that. I thought they recently changed their name to college. Yeah, they, they changed their name. Yeah, 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 Bible colleges in Canada 30, 40 years ago, they're almost all non-existent. Hmm. I mean, it, it's just not, that curriculum is not what current students are looking for, or they will go there and then transfer to a liberal arts. Right. Again, it has to do with going to grad school. I mean, they right. need the accreditation. Myron has, or Joe? Myron. I think, Ken, you raise a good question, but I think Don... I, my question has to do with the sociology of the church that has it developed in the 50s and 60s, maybe even 40s, 50s, and 60s, because it seems to me that what EMU was developing programmatically was really being pressured from external as well as internal, that there were the, the students or the prospective students and the students that came were interested in more things, and that's really what pushed the expansion, it seems to me, into the professional, uh, the more general liberal arts and professional program. Mm -hmm. Don can uh, correct me on this if I'm wrong, but my research tells me that in the early days of Eastern Mennonite school, there were young people who wanted to go on into other areas of study. They were going to go to UVA and so on, and the founding fathers here said, well, we've got to provide that kind of education here. So it wasn't the institution so much as the demands to meet the needs of the uh, uh, students who were going to go elsewhere to school. And that was the kind of vision of the church fathers who wanted to be sure our young people were educated in our context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was very much the early motivation because they were going to other schools and they were going to be lost to the church. And so I agree. Well, I'll, we'll take, we have time for maybe one more question. Is there anyone else uh, with a question? Yes. I'm sure it was. Um, uh, talking about pr uh, President Richard Detweiler, who would have served uh, between uh, Myron and Joe. And uh, was it 86, 84? 87. But w when was the fire? January 84. 84, uh, the ad building burns down. And uh, Joe, you were on the board at that point. Do you want to say a little bit about... Um, just the response of the community and the church. I mean, that was a devastating thing um, to have the ad building burned down. Um, and it, was, rem uh, it yeah. was under being remodeled at that point, as I recall. I remember uh, Richard calling me at, at 6 o'clock in that morning of January and uh, to tell me that uh, uh, the ad building was on fire. And he couldn't talk uh, very well and didn't, it wasn't a long conversation, but wanted to let me know, uh, know what was happening. He was, during those years, he said I was uh, losing my faculty, or losing students, I was losing faculty, and then I burned the place down. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of a real discouraging time uh, for him. Um, that he, he's, he struggled through that time. Yeah. Okay, well, look, this has been an interesting and exciting moment for me. I hope you've enjoyed the session. I'm going to...